As we're currently on lockdown, Helen and I thought we'd use our time wisely and be productive. This meant sorting out the shed, gazebo and having a general spring clean of the back garden. But after about 10 minutes I got bored and I wondered if I could try my hand at some wildlife photography. When I bought the 100-400 G Master from Wex it was second hand and whoever owned the lens before me must have been a wildlife photographer as in the box were some camo lens covers. Wide open the 100-400 to has an aperture of f4.5 to 5.6 depending on the focal length and so I knew if I wanted to blur the background and have the subject stand out I'd have to do a few test shots before setting up the perches. Using the bird table to replicate a branch or subject, I placed it close to the shrub. This was going to be my first test, but I already knew what the outcome was going to be, but for peace of mind, I wanted to do it anyway. I zoomed in at 400mm and with an aperture of 5.6, I focused purely on the bird table. But with the shrub being so close to the table, the background was far too sharp. And with this setup, the subject was never going to stand out. I moved the table back towards the camera and then refocused. This was a lot better. Not perfect, but certainly a workable distance, that's for sure. And during this lockdown period, I have to work with what I've got. The distance from me to the subject was around 4 metres, and from the subject to the background was around 5 metres. And so now I needed a spot of 9 metres minimum to set something up. I was hoping to stay at the bottom end of the garden as the sun rises directly over the house and I thought the bottom end would produce some nice light for early morning photos. But I couldn't really find a spot that was concealed and one that was 9 metres from the shrubs. Shooting from the opposite end of the garden meant I could possibly be shooting into the sun during the early parts of the day. But beggars can't be choosers and if I'm honest how many sunny days do we get in the UK anyway? From the shrubs to the apple tree was around 8 metres and from the tree to the gazebo was around 7 metres. With 15 metres to play with this looked a lot more promising. Time now for a quick test but considering I was so close to the table I may as well make myself comfortable. I was happy with that and so now I needed to try and rig something up that looked a lot more natural than just a bird table. It would have been nice for the log to be a foot or so longer but with a few adjustments I could hopefully get a lot into the photo before I start to see the frame. The test worked okay but as the log was lower than the bird table the background now looked a little messy and so it was time to make a few adjustments. That looked a lot better and if anything with the log being at an angle it just looked more natural to my eyes. I wanted a few different options and so I decided to choose a branch from the apple tree as another perch. I 
I was mindful not to go too far with the secateurs at this point as I could always tidy the branch up afterwards. When I start shooting the log I don't want to see this branch in the photo so I knew it would need repositioning a few times before I was going to be happy with it. The only way I could think of attaching the branch to the trunk was by using screws. And as I didn't want the branch to split, I pre-drilled it with a drill and countersink bit before offering it back up to the tree. Now that the branch was temporarily in place, I could get a better idea of what it looked like through the camera and then make the necessary adjustments. It did look a little cramped and so I decided to move the branch further to the left in order to create more separation. But this still didn't give me what I was after and so it was time to finish the job off with some further pruning. With both the log and the branch in their final positions it was time to drill some 12mm holes into both perches. These would eventually be used as food bowls as I could fill these up with bird seed in order for the birds to be positioned in the right place. I just needed to make sure that the holes were slightly off centre and not visible from the camera side. At this point I have to remind everybody that we are on lockdown and so the only thing that I had to make a hide from was a roll of black DPM that I had in the stores. Well, it was either that or a white dust sheet. The hardest part was actually to guess where to cut, but after a few attempts and a few minor patch repairs, I was relatively happy with the size of the window. However, I must stress I've not used it in anger yet, but these feelings may change. The only small bird seed we had was from the actual bird feeder that hung from the bird table and that only contained half a handful. With this in mind I filled the holes as carefully as I could trying to spill as little as possible. I then raided the kitchen cupboards and filled up the bird feeder with Tesco's own muesli and to be honest they're welcome to it. It tastes absolutely rank. I then loaded up the fat ball feeder and sprinkled some more muesli on the ground. This was to actually attract other birds. As we don't feed the birds from this end of the garden, I wanted as much food on display as possible to encourage them to feed with confidence. All I had to do now was wait and monitor their feeding behaviour over the next few days. I've got a lot to learn about wildlife photography, but I soon realised that by simply covering the lens with some camo sleeving doesn't make a 15 stone man invisible to birds. 
and so I quickly retreated to the man cave and used my curtains as a secondary hide. I was probably behind the camera for a good hour or so, just hoping to catch a glimpse of any bird feeding from the new setup, but nothing came. Then it happened, my first sighting of a bird, a blue tit had appeared and it was feeding. This may not be too impressive for seasoned wildlife photographers, but I can assure you I was absolutely made up. It was hard not to rush down to the hide and set the camera up, but I wanted to give it a few days for the birds to gain confidence and to know that this was the place to get food. The following morning the rooks came and I honestly didn't know what to do. Would they simply just decimate the perches like a plague of locusts? Would they scare off the smaller birds? Should I just shoo them away? In the end I decided not to do anything and just observe them. The pigeons didn't seem bothered by them and that gave me confidence that the other birds wouldn't be phased either. I've not been doing this long enough to know if this is fact or coincidence, but as soon as the rooks left, a robin appeared, followed by a blue tit. Did the rooks and pigeons attract the smaller birds, or would they have come anyway? This is where my lack of experience and knowledge lets me down. Either way, at least I know the rooks didn't scare off the other birds, and to be fair, they was only around for 10 minutes and they was gone again. I was now itching to get into the hide and I was sure things had settled down long enough for me to at least try and grab one shot. It was around 4pm and I didn't have to wait long before the birds started to appear. In terms of photography, I wasn't worried about composition. I was more focused on, well, focus I suppose. Apart from sunrise and sunset, Landscape photography is a fairly slow genre. There's normally time to find a shot, compose, focus and check the histogram before taking that first test shot. Wildlife photography is nothing like that and so I wanted to practice on whatever came my way and wherever it sat on the perch. Over the last few days I've been googling wildlife camera settings but there's nothing like putting theory into practice in order to fully understand them. I'm still a long way away from feeling totally confident, but what I can tell you is this genre of photography is really exciting. The following morning I extended the hide. I added a one meter wide panel on the front to mask me from the birds that were sitting in the tree's branches and a back panel to remove the glare from the observatory when viewed through the window. Then later that afternoon we had a visitor. Every year ducks arrive in the garden and stay on and off for a few weeks while they mate. This was our first duck of the year and so now I'm expecting the pond to be fairly active over the next few weeks. In order to photograph the duck, I had to come out of the hide and walk as slowly as possible, trying not to scare it away. I also had a limited place in where to set up and the spindles were constantly getting in the way. When photographing the small birds from the hide, I feel quite relaxed because I feel if I miss the shot, there's a good chance they'll be back within a few minutes. But when I photographed the duck, I just felt that I was all fingers and thumbs. At first, it just hugged the edge of the pond and looked quite nervous, and at one stage it even got out. I was convinced it would soon get spooked by all my fumbling with the camera and would just fly off. But much to my relief, it got back in the water 
and as long as I didn't make any sudden moves, it seemed relaxed. As a landscape photographer, I tried to stick to ISO 100 whenever possible, and the only times I crank up the ISO is when I'm trying to freeze frame some waves. But whenever I've gone above 2000 with a Sony, I've been disappointed with the noise levels. But that just may be me, as I don't have to process noise very much in an image. For the early shots, a shutter speed of 1 over 400 and an ISO of 640 worked okay. But as the duck started to duck under the water to clean itself, I knew I had no option but to raise the ISO if I wanted to really increase the shutter speed to capture the water droplets. The average shot was around 1 over 640 with an ISO of 1600. The only shot I wish I could have increased my shutter speed for was the last shot. But having said that, my focus could have been off a little. In terms of the focus area, I was using flexible spot small. And looking back, I should have possibly used expand flexible spot. Again, these are the kind of things that I'm playing around with at the moment. On the whole, I did manage to get some reasonable shots that I was quite pleased with, but with more practice, I'll hopefully be able to increase my hit rate as time goes on. After watching the birds feed for a few days, I was starting to recognise some of their patterns. They'd mainly perch on the branches that sat above the bird feeder before dropping down onto it. The only times they used my artificial perch was when there was more than one bird trying to feed at the same time. And then they'd jump onto my perch for a few seconds before jumping back onto the bird feeder. And so to increase my hit rate, I thought it may be better to have the bird feeder below my perch. This worked a lot better, and within the first hour of its repositioning, I'd seen more birds land on it than I had over the last few days combined. I also made another adjustment to the log. Now that the birds were feeding quite happily from it, I broke up the fat bowl and sprinkled it into the crack. This worked really well. Plus now that the bird feeder was in its new position, it was only a few inches from the edge of the log, so now they could flit quite naturally between the two. Because of the current restrictions, myself and millions of others around the world have been forced into an unnatural situation. And up until now, wildlife photography has never featured in my photography plans. I just figured I'd need one of those huge telephoto lenses that cost the same price as a good quality second hand car. Or I'd need to stand in a field somewhere just waiting for something to fly overhead. At the same time missing the shot completely and ending up coming away with 500 pictures of an overhead electrical power line. And so if this week has taught me anything I now know that this couldn't be further from the truth. It's been quite amazing to watch the numbers of birds growing this week and as soon as I can get back to the shops I'll be buying different foods in order to attract other species of wildlife into the back garden. But for the foreseeable future I'm going to be shooting more backyard wildlife and so if you'd like to follow my journey then please feel free to subscribe, comment and tap the little notification bell for future videos. And if you'd like to share any of my videos on social media, then please feel free as it really does help a small channel like mine to grow. But until my next video, be kind and stay safe.